Hello, everybody. My name is Daniela Klapp. On behalf of Medical Learning Institute, the Endocrine Society, and Expir Medical Education, welcome to this accredited symposia, thanks to an educational grant by Lily. Our tremendous faculties, you see there, has worked hard over the past several months creating this presentation to meet your needs. So I leave you with our great faculty. So let me share some thoughts about the goals of diabetes care with you. Every year in January, we wait for the first issue of diabetes care. And there they publish the standards of medical care in diabetes. And basically, what are we doing? What are we trying to do? We try to improve cardiometabolic health. We try to prevent complications. And very important for the patients themselves to improve health-related quality of life. So where do we stand in optimal diabetes care? And these are data from the NHANES study. And I think uh, on the left side, on the far left side, you can see uh, the HbA1c achievement of an HbA1c goal below 7%. Then uh, the blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80. And the non-HDL cholesterol less than 130. And these are data from 1999 to 2018. And you see different uh, time periods. And what you can see up to 2010, it's getting better actually with HbA1c achievement, blood pressure achievement, and non-LDL cholesterol achievement. But then it levels off and it's even getting worse. And this is something which is really striking. So if you look at the far right, you see a triple endpoint, having a HbA1c less than 7%, blood pressure less than 140 over 90, non-HDL cholesterol less than 130, and you see it's, it's improving over time, but then it, there's some sort of stagnation, and this is something which is actually, it's sad, uh, looking at the new medications, the availability of new medications over the last time. But what we see in the same time, we see a twin epidemics of type 2 diabetes and obesity. And, and here you can see data from the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in the U.S. population. And you see around 2000, it was about 9.8 percent. And now it's, it's about 14.3 percent. And this is true. This is an increase by 46 percent, which is uh, tremendous. And what you can see, we have a stagnation with the undiagnosed uh, population, which is good because obviously we might catch it earlier. If you look at obesity, BMI uh, above 30, what you can see in 2000 with a prevalence of 30.5 percent, and now by 2018 it was 42.4. This is an increase of 36 uh, percent. And what else you can see here down, it's the increase in severe morbid obesity. There's a doubling, doubling over the time period. So uh, there is a, we call it, might call it syndemic, the obesity. Obesity leads to different changes on, uh, in of the metabolism in liver, in uh, muscle, in pancreas, and in adipose tissue. And this, based on a genetic predisposition, promotes two core defects of type 2 diabetes, which is insulin resistance and beta cell decompensation. You're well aware of that. However, we also have some other factors promoting uh, type 2 diabetes, which are sleep disorders, the inability to be active, and of course, stigma and impaired mental health. So then we, of course, have this social environment, the disadvantage, socio-cultural barriers, and income inequalities. And the problem is this is like a vicious circle, because type 2 diabetes per se can promote obesity. For example, think of medication-induced weight gain, neuropathy and the decreased activity level, hypoglycemia and stimulation of food intake, stigma again and impaired hand, mental health. And then you have the physical environment, which is food, availability of food, uh, physical activity, lack of physical activity, safety, and alcohol. We know from studies with diets, like the direct study, or bariatric or metabolic surgery, that weight loss matters. And the amount of weight loss is also very important. We know that small amounts of weight loss are capable to improving measures of glycemia, triglycerides, blood pressure. However, if you want to achieve better outcomes, you have to have a greater weight loss. So for example, for hepatic steatosis, for NASH activity, 
uh, apnea, hypopnea index, and a reduction in CV events, which you have only seen so far for bariatric or metabolic surgery. So it, it, it matters how much people lose weight when they have diabetes. And this is acknowledged by the uh, joint EASD ADA recommendations for pharmaceutical treatment, and they clearly state if there is no uh, atherosclerotic vascular disease, if there is no renal or cardiac disease, heart failure, then uh, one should focus on minimizing weight gain or promoting weight loss. And this is preferably done with GP1 receptor agonist or dual agonist, as you will see in a moment, or SGLT2, uh, but to a lesser extent. But we, we must not forget that we have social determinants of health, which are equally important, like genetic background, obesity, lack of exercise. This is, first of all, education and access to education and quality of education. This starts early in childhood. We have healthcare, the access to healthcare and to quality. We have, of course, neighborhood and built environment. It makes a difference when you can walk, when you can bike. Uh, it's social and community context. We have seen that in the pandemic. And it's economic stability. And many of those determinants actually are under enormous pressure in these times. So when we go back, uh, we see over the last 15 years new medications, new classes of medications. Uh, in 2007, we saw uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, which show favorable weight loss profiles, a risk reduction in cardiovascular disease. In 2015, we had the launch of SGLT2 inhibitors, again with less but still weight loss and better blood pressure profiles, CV risk reduction, and renal and cardiac protection. And now, it's already launched in the US and in the United Arab Emirates, hopefully soon in the EU. We see the dual GIP GLP-1 receptor agonist, the Zepatide in that case. It's, it's a novel uh, receptor agonist. It's a completely new class, once weekly injected. And as you will see from the subsequent uh, talks, you will see with enhanced glycemic control and weight loss benefits. Thank you so much. And I will proceed and ask Professor Nauk to come to the stage. I don't have to introduce him. He has been introduced many times, and everybody who is in this field knows his name. Thank you. So I will be talking about delineating the incretin effect and the roles of GLP-1 and GIP, the two incretin hormones, uh, and that is related to the potential benefits of agonism of multiple receptors, and I want to shed some light on the potential mechanisms of action. And really, what is important to start with is the incretin effect. In panel A, you see glucose going up and down again, once with oral glucose, and secondly, almost hidden behind the same symbols, with intravenous glucose. So the glycemic stimulus is the same. But as you can see in panels B and C, insulin goes up much higher, and C-peptide as well, with oral glucose. Oh, sorry, this is E and F I'm talking about. And the reason behind this is really the secretion of incretin hormones, GIP and GLP-1. They're not secreted at all with intravenous glucose, but they are profoundly stimulated to be secreted from specialized endocrine cells in the gut. So it's going up like sevenfold for GIP and threefold for GLP-1. And that explains the difference in insulin and C-peptide curves. And if you now look at the right-hand panels, the left-hand panels more or less repeat what you have seen in the first slide. This is now the same experiment in type 2 diabetes. And you can see, of course, the levels of glycemia are different in the fasting state and post-load. But the difference that you typically see in the rise in insulin and C-peptide is much less. So there is a reduced and in some patients even absent incretin effect. And we now know, and I will just briefly mention this in words, that there is no general difference in how GIP and GLP-1 are secreted between healthy subjects and type 2 
diabetic patients. So it's not a difference in secretion, a lack of availability of incretins, but it's their effect. And this is a very simple experiment in patients with type 2 diabetes who received a therapy with basal insulin. We stopped that therapy, and the next day when they were hyperglycemic, they received an infusion of either placebo in gray, GIP in blue, uh, GLP-1 in green and the combination in red. And what you can see in blue, not much difference in uh, blood sugar compared to placebo, at least no significant difference. And if you compare the gray and blue lines with respect to insulin or C-peptide and insulin secretion, not much of a difference. However, GLP-1 in green first of all, is sufficient to normalize glycemica. So after six hours, they all had a normal blood sugar. And also, you see the transient stimulation of insulin C-peptide and insulin secretion rates. And surprisingly, if you add GIP on top of GLP-1, it doesn't make a difference. So basically, what this uh, indicates to us is that in type 2 diabetes, there is an inability of GIP to stimulate insulin secretion, certainly uh, if you aim at a sufficient stimulation to lower blood sugar. The next role of GIP that is being discussed is in the role of body weight regulation. And I will present to you the old view, the traditional view, which is mainly based on the examination of GIP receptor knockout mice. Uh, if they are overfed with a high fed diet, that means GIP is expressed more in the gut, they uh, absorb more glucose from the gut, GIP is insulinotropic, so there is more insulin around, and this increases the ability of becoming a fat animal. So basically, GIP was viewed as an obesogenic hormone. But now we have recent findings on GIP receptor agonism or combined agonism on the GIP and GLP-1 receptor that challenges this old view. So GIP receptor stimulation may lead to reduced food intake and weight loss. And some cells in the hypothalamus that have GIP receptors have also been uh, identified. So basically, this is summarized in this, uh, in this cartoon. So you lose body weight by reducing your food intake if you are a wild-type mouse with an intact GIP receptor, and you don't see this whether you inject acyl GIP into the uh, intracerebral ventricular fluid or into the periphery as long as you have the GIP receptor. But unfortunately, simple studies in humans have not confirmed this. So if you infuse even large amounts of GIP into human subjects and then test what is their appetite and how much food do they eat, uh, you will no longer see an effect. And if you combine it with GLP-1, that is one published study mentioned in the bottom of this slide, they even say it compromises the effect that they usually see with a single infusion of GLP-1. So some discrepancy between animal experiments and human experiments. Last, I want to show you how in healthy subjects, GIP and GLP-1 interact in the postprandial stimulation of insulin secretion. And what you can see here is experiments employing specific antagonists at the GIP receptor, that is GIP-3 to 30 amide, and at the GLP-1 receptor, that is exendin 9 to 39. And what you can appreciate if you inhibit both incretin hormones, uh, that is what you see in red dots, that gives you the highest increase in glycemia following uh, an oral glucose load, and it gives you uh, the, high, uh, the, the greatest uh, reduction in the insulinogenic index, which means both incretin hormones together 
with the major part played by GIP, explain the physiological incretin effect, but that says that under normal physiological conditions, they interact in an additive manner in order to stimulate insulin secretion to meet the needs of such a meal situation. So with this, I will finish and ask Juan Pablo Frias to come on uh, and give us his information on terzapatite. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, I can say my disclosures and Professor Nauks can also be found on, on the app. So I'm now going to sort of go translating what, what Professor Nauk was just speaking of and what we've seen in the clinic. We've had a, a great opportunity over the years to be very involved in this clinical development program, as have the other two speakers, and now for me using it in clinic as well over the past three months or so since its approval um, in the U.S. So terzepatide, as you probably know, is a dual agonist of both the GIP and the GLP-1 receptor. It is based on the backbone peptide sequence of GIP, and it's been modified to be able to bind to and stimulate both GIP and GLP-1 receptors. And importantly, it has, it's isolated with a 20-carbon um, fatty diacid moiety which binds to albumin, extending its half-life to approximately five days. And what this does is allow for once-weekly dosing. So it is a once-weekly subcutaneous injection. A number of trials or studies have been done looking at the mechanism of action. Certainly, it enhances the incretin effect, so it enhances first and second phase insulin secretion compared to selective GLP-1 receptor agonists such as semaglutide, and actually reduces glucagon concentrations as well versus dulaglutide. We've looked at that, and semaglutide. And studies in patients with various degrees of renal and hepatic dysfunction have shown that the pharmacokinetics, or terzepatide concentrations, are similar irrespective of, for example, their degree of renal function. So there's no need to make any dose adjustments based on renal function. So the bottom line, this is a unimolecular multi in this case, dual agonist. It's a single molecule that binds to and stimulates two pharmacologic targets, which are the GIP and GLP-1 receptors. Now, if we look at the phase three clinical program, so the clinical development program, it really spans the spectrum of type 2 diabetes on your left as monotherapy, so patients treated with or not well treated with diet and exercise versus placebo, and all the way on your right versus, um, versus placebo in patients poorly controlled on basal insulin. And you'll also note that SURPASS-2 was a study with an active comparator, and this is the one trial in the phase three program comparing terzepatide to a selective GLP-1 receptor agonist, in this case, um, once weekly um, semaglutide at a dose of one milligram. And I think very importantly also, there is an ongoing dedicated cardiovascular outcomes trial, the SURPASS CVOT. This has an active comparator, which is dulaglutide, and is expected to report out in 2024. This is the general design of all of the phase three studies. So basically, it was three arms of terzepatide at a dose of 5, 10, and 15 milligrams, either versus placebo and surpass one and surpass five, or versus an active comparator, surpass two with semaglutide, surpass three, which Dr. Ludwig was the first author of, was, um, was versus insulin degladec, and surpass four versus insulin glargine that was titrated. And um, the studies were either a 40 or 52 week duration for the primary endpoint. And in all of these trials, the primary endpoint had to do with the change in hemoglobin A1C from baseline to study end. And the key secondary endpoint in all of these trials was change in body weight. And you can see the way that terzepatide was initiated. And this is also the way in which it's used or it's labeled in the United States, which is initiation with 2.5 milligrams once weekly for the initial four weeks of therapy, and then escalating the dose in 2.5 milligram increments every four weeks until in these studies, the randomized dose was 
reached, the 5, 10, or 15 milligrams. So the 5 milligram dose is reached after 4 weeks, the 10 milligram after 12 weeks, and the 15 milligram dose, which is the maximal dose, is reached after 20 weeks of therapy. I'll just quickly review the key um, endpoints here. So this looks at the change in hemoglobin A1C from baseline to end of study across the five surpassed trials. And sort of the key here is, you know, a very robust reductions in A1C with the 5, 10, and 15 milligram dose, statistically significantly greater reductions versus placebo and also versus the active comparators. And here I show the surpass two data with respect to A1C lowering. You can see on your right from a mean A1C of 8.3%, and this is looking at the efficacy estimate. You can see a 2.4 to 2.5% reduction in A1C with the 15 milligram dose down to an A1C of less, on average A1C of less than 6%. And again, with the three terzepatide doses, 5, 10, and 15 milligrams by week 40, significantly greater reduction in A1C than what was seen with the one milligram dose of once weekly semaglutide. I'll also point out, if you look very early during the first four weeks of this study, and I point this out a lot when I'm speaking to clinicians in the U.S., there was already, all patients at that point were on 2.5 milligrams. During that four-week period, you see a mean reduction in A1C from 8.3 to 7.5 during four weeks, so a 0.8% mean reduction in A1C. So very powerful, even at the starting dose of 2.5 milligrams. And on your right, you see target attainment of hemoglobin A1Cs, less than 7%, almost 90% of the patients treated with the higher doses of terzepatide. And um, as we saw in the phase two studies, a large proportion of patients actually normalizing their glycemic control as evidenced by an A1C of less than 5.7%, up to 46% of the patients in, in surpass two and higher in some of the other surpass trials, but generally anywhere between 45 and, and 55 percent. Similar slide now for change in body weight. So double digit reduction in body weight with respect to the proportion or the, the relative reduction in body weight. You can see in surpass two, for example, a 13% reduction in body weight on average and very consistent across the five studies. And I think it's important to take um, into consideration that these were not weight loss studies. So these were not studies where patients were seeing dietitians at a calorie deficit diet, et cetera, et cetera. This was a secondary endpoint. And again, in each case, a greater reduction in body weight at study end with the three doses of terzepatide versus the comparators. And again, I'll show a couple of the studies. So surpass two versus semaglutide. You see dose-dependent reduction in body weight with the three terzepatide doses. And again, with each of the three doses, significantly greater weight reduction with terzepatide, up to 13% mean reduction in body weight with the, with the highest dose versus semaglutide. And then surpass three. And here, the um, this is out to 52 weeks. You can see that it's just starting to level off um, with respect to, to the loss in body weight at about week 52. And as expected, the comparator here was insulin degladec. You see an increase in body weight with, with the degladec. I don't have a slide here, but in surpass four, which went out to two years, so 104 weeks, you saw that the, the plateau in body weight occurred generally shortly after, on average, after 52 weeks, maybe between 52 and 60 weeks or so. And um, we also obviously looked at clinically relevant body weight reduction. This is just showing the proportion of patients who had greater than or equal to 10% weight reduction. Again, very consistent in these trials, anywhere from 40 to 60% at the highest dose, having greater than 10% weight reduction, which is obviously very clinically significant, as Dr. Bernhardt um, explained in his talk. And lastly, with respect to the data, one um, pre-specified endpoint that we looked at in surpass two, again, terzepatide versus semaglutide, and it was a composite endpoint the proportion of patients at study end, so at week 40, that achieved all three of these, a hemoglobin A1C of less than or equal to 6.5%, 
greater than or equal to 10% weight reduction, and no clinically significant hypoglycemia, so no level 2 or severe hypoglycemia, and it was reached by 60% of the, of the patients treated with a 15 milligram dose compared to 22% of the patients treated with semaglutide. With respect to safety and tolerability, a very comparable safety and tolerability profile to the selective GLP-1 receptor agonist, so GI side effects being the most common. You can see here nausea was the most common of these, occurring anywhere from 17 to 22 percent of the patients treated with terzepatide at any given time during the study. And this shows nausea now in the incidence in four-week blocks throughout the study. And the things to point out here is that as with the selective GLP-1 receptor agonist, it occurs generally during dose escalation, so early in the course of therapy. Most was mild to moderate in severity, you see in green and in orange there, and tended to dissipate over time. And again, quite comparable to what was seen with the selective GLP-1 receptor agonist. I will tell you, in this study, though, we were not, we were blinded, actually, I should say, to what terzepatide dose patients were on, and we were not allowed to de-escalate the dose, which certainly is something I would do in clinic in a patient who wasn't tolerating. With respect to hypoglycemia, given the mechanism of action, you would not expect significant hypoglycemia either as monotherapy or in combination with agents that, make, uh, that do not cause, I should say, hypoglycemia, so metformin or an SGLT2 inhibitor. But you may get an increase in sulfonylurea or insulin-induced hypoglycemia. So from, again, from a clinical perspective, when these drugs are initiated, when terzepatide is initiated, we should certainly consider proactively reducing the dose of insulin secretagogues or insulin um, if the patient, particularly if the patient, is very close to their target. And lastly, there, um, uh, the, the official sort of cardiovascular outcomes trial is ongoing, as I mentioned, surpassed CBOT. But there was a pooled analysis of seven clinical trials of over 26-week duration, which looked at four-point MACE. And you can see that there was, a, over the course of, of these trials, the, um, the hazard ratio showed a 20 percent reduction, which was not statistically significant, but this was not powered for that. So we can certainly say that from a cardiovascular perspective, it is safe. And again, we're awaiting the results of surpass um, CVOT. Now, in Europe, it has, terzepatide has received a positive opinion. We're waiting on the label, but here's a European indication that will likely be, which is indicated for adults with insufficiently controlled type 2 diabetes as an adjunct to diet and exercise, as monotherapy in patients who cannot use metformin, or in addition to other medicinal products for diabetes, and this is very similar to the U.S. indication. In the U.S., and I imagine this will be in Europe as well, it comes in a single-dose um, pen with, um, with an auto-injector, very similar to the pen for dulaglutide, and it's available in six doses, a starting dose of 2.5 milligrams, and then the maintenance dose of 5, 7.5, 10, 12.5, and 15 milligrams, and you can see the recommendation for initiation and subsequent dose escalation based on the patient's response is similar to what we did in the clinical trials. And lastly, the contraindications, similar to the long-acting selective GLP-1 receptor agonist, contraindicated in patients with either a family or personal history of medullary thyroid carcinoma or a personal history of MEN2. It was not studied in patients with a history of pancreatitis and not indicated for type 1 diabetes. And very comparable warnings and precautions to what's seen with the selective GLP-1 receptor agonist. So to summarize, terzepatide is a unimolecular dual GIP and GLP-1 receptor agonist. Based on preclinical and clinical studies, its mechanism of action, and this is, a, a, as Michael mentioned, um, an area of very active um, investigation, is probably both um, synergistic and complementary effects of binding and, and activating both the GIP and GLP-1 receptors. Phase two and phase three clinical trials have shown A1C and body weight reductions versus placebo and active comparators, including selective GLP-1 receptor agonists across the spectrum of type 2 diabetes. 
recently approved, and we've been using it in the U.S. outside of clinical trials for about three months now, but also received a positive opinion in Europe. And it's currently being studied for a number of other therapeutic indications, including obesity, fatty liver disease, and many comorbidities that are associated with obesity and obesity complications. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and we are going to have about five minutes or so of Q&A now. Marianne Gallagher from Denmark. Impressive data. I'm really, really amazed to see really, really uh, so great data in the type 2 population. Have you any data on how long time it potentially these subjects will regain weight when you stop treatment? And if so, if, or uh, how long uh, period of time would you expect it to if you don't have any data? Yeah. So I think we have experience with GLP-1 receptor agonists that also have an indication for the treatment of obesity. Mm -hmm. And it, it is very obvious that it takes a long time, uh, a year or so in the case of terzepatide, to reach the new plateau. But you will always reach such a, a new plateau. And with uh, the GLP-1 receptor agonists, it's the same when you discontinue. Then they will regain weight and probably end pretty much where they started at baseline. So it is meant for, for a continuous, a continuous therapy. Treatment. Yeah, and, and that, although we do not have data, that is being looked at in one of the surmount trials, which are the obesity trials that are ongoing, where everyone initiated with trisepatide and then subsequently were randomized either to go to placebo or to continue trisepatide. So we'll see that. But I, I completely agree with Michael, probably needs to be chronic therapy for there to be continued effect. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice data. Let's put these, what you have heard in the SERPAS uh, three studies, in some clinical context. And you all know and heard it repeatedly, we don't have it yet. And it's around in the U.S. for three months. So we don't have really long, they don't have long-term data, but you ha have heard that it's really working pretty soon. So first of all, we have to talk in addition, before we just prescribe medications for the treatment of diabetes, we have to think about our communication regarding weight management, and I think it's very important because patients just don't like the terms excess fat, obese, and obesity. So we probably have to change a little bit our wording and prefer terms like excess body weight, BMI, or above ideal body weight, and maintaining a healthy weight because that's very important, a healthy weight. So first of all, of course, this is indicated for treating patients with diabetes, but of what we see, again, is a very pronounced weight loss, and I'm quite sure the patients are going for that, So, but still we have to discuss weight. So what we can do is actually, when we ask the patient about the further treatment, it's a shared decision approach. So let's say as we get our glucose under control, do you have additional goals concerning your weight? And I, I think most of the patients, 90% are overweight or obese, will go for that. And maybe you can also ask what kind of help from me do you want uh, for for your weight, uh, probably reduction. I think this is a we have to have a very sensitive approach about that. So uh, we have cases here, typical cases you all see in your clinics and practices. And this is Rudolf. He's 30, uh, 63 years. He has type 2 diabetes since 2017. He always was struggling with obesity. His current BMI is 31. And he's treated with metformin and empagliflozin, and this HbA1c is 8.1%. There's no evidence of uh, cardiovascular disease. He undergoes yearly screening with an exercise test. And so usually uh, we recommended insulin uh, as a failure of oral glucose-lowering therapy. But if we look closer into the recommendations we have seen over the last years that uh, GP1 agonist in that case should be preferred because of the effect on weight and hypoglycemia. So uh, what, what we also s agree is that the treatment with a GP1 receptor agonist or a GP1 receptor agonist like tisepatide is considered as an alternative to basal insulin because we can achieve even greater weight loss. Uh, 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 we can achieve weight loss and a greater decrease in HbA1c without risk of hypoglycemia. So in that specific patient, we would go for uh, and we have proof from the studies to go for this appetite because it has been shown, as you've seen, 
uh, that in surplus two that it has superiority over GLP-1 receptor agonist, which is semaglutide, one milligram. And we have seen a surplus three study. Uh, it was also superior compared to declotec insulin, which is the most uh, advanced basal insulin analog. And in that study, we saw a drop in HP1C of 2.1% and a drop in body weight by 11.3 kilograms. So what would we expect from treating uh, Rudolf with the sepatide for one year? We could expect to have an HP1C of 6.0% and the BMI of 28.6 kilograms, which puts him in another category from obesity into overweight. So this is a one likely candidate for the initiation of the zepatide following uh, failure of oral uh, therapy. And this case two is Monica. She's slightly older, uh, 69 years. She has type 2 diabetes since 2013. She is likely obese, BMI is 31. And she's treated with metformin, empagliflozin, and semaglutide once weekly. And her current HbA1c is 7.4. There again is no evidence of cardiovascular disease, but there is evidence of non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And as you will agree, her HbA1c is not where we want to have it. We want to have it at least below 7%. So again, in this patient, usually one would consider basal insulin in addition to reach the HbA1c goals. However, what you could do, and you have seen that in the surplus 2 study, one could Alternatively, of course, switch from c to GIP-GLP-1 agonist like tezepatide because uh, it's most likely that we achieve an HP1C goal less than 7% together with weight loss. And so tezepatide was indeed chosen, or would be chosen actually, it's, a, it's uh, over c because we have the results of the surplus 2 study and the difference between both agents was a HP1C difference of minus 0.4 and a body weight difference of 5.5 kilograms. So what could we expect after one year treatment when Monica is treated with desepatide in addition to her current metformin and SGLT2 inhibitors? We could expect an HP1C of 6.7% further weight reduction and again putting her from an obesity category, her weight from an obesity category to overweight category. So I, I hope I could set these, uh, these uh, results you have heard with the surplus two studies in, in patient cases, and thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. Great, great cases. I received a, a question, um, and um, it, maybe Bernard, you can answer this, which has to do with whether um, terzepatide can be used in patients with a past history of pancreatitis. What are your thoughts on that? Cautious with that because pancre you have seen, it. I mean, there is no proof that any of those drugs cause pancreatitis. And over the surpass program, there was no. No, indi no indication that uh, there's an uh, increase in uh, the risk of pancreatitis, but still, I think it's, we would be very careful in those patients. Of course, you have also to consider what type of pancreatitis. Right. If, if it was a stone, for example, then I would say, yes, there's no problem. But if you don't know the right reason for pancreatitis, I would be really careful unless we have uh, other data. Yeah, I would agree, yeah, particularly in unexplained pancreatitis, you know, which, which is what you alluded to. I, I agree with that 100 percent. And Michael, the, there was a follow on question to that, which had to do with people with gallbladder disease. Um, yeah. yeah. So let me uh, talk about the first question first. Uh, about 12 years ago, there was real concern that GLP-1 receptor agonists cause acute pancreatitis and even pancreatic cancer. Uh, and uh, now the CVOTs have very carefully looked at this, and this is no longer true. So there is no increased risk for pancreatitis with uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists. But most of the studies, because this was unclear, have never included patients with a history of acute pancreatitis. So basically, there is a knowledge gap now. Uh, I would, uh, would be prepared to study such patients in a controlled trial, but since we don't have the data, we have to be cautious. And now the, the second question is about uh, 
uh, retinopathy, uh, uh, gallbladder Gallbladder. disease, uh, sorry, Uh, that is a fact with GLP-1 receptor agonists that there is always an imbalance in all kinds of gallbladder-related or biliary complications. It is like 30 to 40 percent higher relative risk to develop such complications, but at a very, very low level. And what we know is that in an obese type 2 diabetic population, we expect many of them to have pre-existing gallstones. And we do not really know, is it those patients where then suddenly it becomes painful and therefore is diagnosed, or is the weight loss associated with these agents the cause that you have more gallstones? Because if you lose body weight through any method, the risk for gallstones is increased. There is no general recommendation that you should not use it, but I think I would inform my patient that there is this imbalance, that this may happen, and that they should simply tell you if they have symptomatic gallstone associated disease because independent from this kind of treatment this would always mean you should do something about it uh, usually you then uh, recommend a cholecystectomy but this is true for bariatric surgery we see it after massive weight loss you have yeah. gallstones that our bariatric surgeons have to remove the gallbladder uh, sometimes when they have stones there because because of the risk it's simply related to weight loss don't you yeah. agree yeah yeah, and I, I would say that's probably the, the mechanism. It's just more of a weight loss related mechanism. The other, the other question that came out was, should all patients before initiating terzepatide have an eye exam? And patients, you know, patients who had pre-existing proliferative retinopathy or retinopathy that required acute treatment or maculopathy were not studied in in the SURPASS program. So all of these patients went to an ophthalmologist or an optometrist, had retinal photographs. Um, There is no thinking that it causes worsening of retinopathy in and of itself, but certainly with very rapid reductions in A1C, folks with unstable retinopathy can have temporary worsening. It is not recommended necessarily that they have to go have fundal photographs, but these patients should have a retinal exam in the office and be, we should be very cautious with patients with unstable retinopathy in these trials. Michael. May I add something? So I think this, this question came up uh, with a SUSTAIN-6 study with right. semaglutide. And so it's always asked in connection with starting a therapy with a potent uh, incretin mimetic. Uh, in fact, I think this is a question totally in the, independent from that kind of treatment because it is relevant for those with pre-existing advanced retinopathy who start a therapy that will bring their blood sugar and HB1C down considerably and always they should be seen by an ophthalmologist. You have to know in your patients whether they have advanced retinopathy and action is independent totally independent from uh, the prescription of an incretin mimetic. Uh, right. And we have seen that in type 1 diabetes, DCCT, it led to a worsening in the very beginning yeah. and, and then it got better. So I think we, we know that for many, many years. Hi, uh, this is Samuel from India. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations on the Samount 1 data. Uh, just wanted to uh, get a couple of uh, insights on the commercial side of things. Uh, at earlier, I think at the Q2 uh, results, company had indicated that they would be discussing with the FDA regarding filing. So do we think they would uh, go ahead uh, based on the Samount data, or are we going to wait for the other data? To- yeah, we, you know what, we didn't focus on, on Samount data here, and that's probably a better question for, for the company, unfortunately. We do know, as, as you know, the Surmount um, was presented, Surmount 1, the initial part, and, and it, was, it was published in the New England Journal. There, there are three other studies that, that are being conducted as well, but I think that's a better answer or question for, for Eli Lilly folks and for us. Uh, just another follow-up. Uh, around Asian patients, uh, there was an article recently stating that uh, we might see too much of uh, weight loss in the Asian population. Uh, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I think I think that's true of any. Certainly, the 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 studies from Japan were recently published. I think with with any patient. I mean, certainly a lot of my patients in the U.S. as well. You may not want the degree of weight loss that you may get with a 15 milligram dose, but you know what? I mean, there anyway. We have five, seven and a half, ten, twelve and a half, and 15. So I think we need to individualize care, and I think it's actually something very positive to have a very wide spectrum of doses. And we see that the five milligram dose is very effective. So if you have a patient that, you know, weight loss may not be their main concern or don't want to don't want to lose too much weight, you certainly have the option to go to a lower dose. That's what I would say. I don't know if my colleagues have any other comment. Yeah. So I, I think what we have learned is that you predominantly lose fat mass, and that is usually not bad for most of the patients. And I think the SERPAS 3 MRI study really clearly demonstrates if you, you lose fat in the liver. To no, I, I, absolutely. I think it was over 80% of the patients had greater than 30% relative reduction in liver fat content, which is a very clinically relevant metric. So you, you really do clear fat out of the liver. But some people still, you know, elderly patients who are frail, for example, patients who just do not want to lose that much weight, you have the option of having other doses that are very effective from a glycemic and a weight loss perspective, but may not be as potent. Because you saw the, the weight loss was definitely dose dependent. Thank you. I think we'll, we'll wrap up. I want to uh, thank Dr. Ludwig, Dr. Nauk, Professor Nauk, and thank you all very much. Bye-bye.